Well. Um, so um, Mundele is international is the largest snack food company in the world. Um, Irene, I'd like to start by asking you about your view on what the biggest mistakes CEOs usually make when it comes to approaching innovation. Um, what, where do people go wrong as they talk about this and strategize? I think the thinking about innovation as something that happens in a vacuum is the biggest mistake. So I think many companies, uh, and I would say, you know, in our, in our past, we would have been victims of this. It tends to be an isolated group. There's always been a debate about whether, particularly in packaged goods, whether or not there ought to be a separate innovation group that knows a lot about how to move fast and understands the disciplines of introducing a new product, whether you ought to separate those people from your established brands. Mm -hmm. And the lesson that we've learned is there's real value in it being integrated. When, when I uh, launched Mondelez, the, the big opportunity for us was to move a lot faster. You know, we were a growth company. Speed is the currency of a growth company. And thinking about what we needed to do to get ideas from one part of the world to another faster was really important to me. And in that context, I really worked hard to put together a broad team of people that would be focused on innovation, that we call them global category teams. And these groups are responsible for our biggest brands, thinking about how to market a brand like Oreo or Cadbury or Milka on a global stage. And the benefit of that is it allows us to understand a variety of cultures. It allows us to move much faster. Many of you may have read the story about the launch of China, of Oreo in China. And uh, our first attempt to do that was not very successful because we pretty much took an American cookie and we tried to bring it to Chinese consumers. Once we integrated that effort with our Chinese colleagues and we made sure that we understood what was different about their market. They were looking for a less sweet product. They needed smaller packages. They wanted a, uh, a, a slightly thinner type product. Once we brought that understanding to the team that understood everything there was to understand about Oreo, all of a sudden we, we then created the, 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 the number one cookie in China. So it is about having a broad team that really represents a variety of disciplines, in our case, a variety of geographies. And I think that's what's allowed us to, uh, to be able to generate 13 to 14% of our revenue from new products, which I'd say is pretty much uh, at the top of our industry. Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn was here earlier today, and he said that every industry, even if you're in a traditional industry, needs uh, to have a software strategy. So every company needs to have a software strategy. Do you have a software strategy? What does he mean by a software strategy? It means investing in software, trying to figure out how you have proprietary software and how it can affect your business, rather than saying, you know, we're a car company, but and we'll yeah. leave the software development to someone else, for example. Yeah, well, I'm a food company, so so for us, um, software is an enabler. It's not it's not our main event. I would say for us, though. The ability for information is our big opportunity. And the biggest enabler that technology has brought to us is the opportunity to really understand our consumers far more intimately, to be able to understand and analyze their shopping baskets. It's particularly relevant as we think about e-commerce because uh, very often the shopping list that consumers are using in an e-commerce transaction are just their past, based on their past behavior. And so for us, the opportunity to use some of the new technology and access to consumer information in a creative way is what allows us to stay uh, at the top of our industry. There was all this hope that big data would revolutionize every industry. Have you found that your process for coming up with new products, like you mentioned, the 10% of sales that come from these new product lines, um, has that speeded up? Have you, when we think about the technology of food um, and product discovery yes. and consumer research, how has it evolved with the use of data? Well, it's been a big, a big enabler to us. We can, you know, what used to take maybe six weeks to do a survey, a paper and pencil survey, you, you would have all experienced getting uh, intercepted in a shopping mall. I mean, now we can do these things overnight. So we get data much faster. Uh, 3D printing allows us to prototype a lot faster. So, uh, you know, in the, it's very hard for consumers to envision ideas that they haven't seen yet. And so the more we can do to bring those ideas to life in a tangible way, uh, that really gives us uh, a real opportunity to move a lot quicker. So yes, it, it has helped us to move faster and I think actually to, uh, to better meet the needs of our customers. And you are using 3D printing? 
We are. That's really interesting. I feel like we don't hear very often about concrete case studies. Well, you know, again, if you think about concrete. a simple idea like an Oreo, it's an embossed cookie. In the old days, we'd have to show a consumer a picture of what it might look like with a spring flower or a Halloween uh, uh, ghost on it or something. Now we actually can make the cookie. Mm. And, uh, and it obviously, it's just an easier, it's easier for people to visualize. It allows us, again, to prototype much more rapidly and to, uh, to get the ideas to the marketplace much faster. I think one of the biggest business stories that we talk about internally is the rise of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, it has not happened overnight by any means, but it seems to have reached an inflection point. And with the, the closure of several hundred Walmart stores um, and Amazon spike in holiday sales, it does seem like the future of retail is increasingly online. How, how are you betting how, um, on the future of brick and mortar? Um, and how will that affect your business? Well. Even as it grows very rapidly, and it is, um, the facts are it's not replacing bricks and mortar. I think there will be some winners and losers in the bricks and mortar space. The facts are for, for, for food in general, you know, as you can imagine, staples like diapers and detergent are still far more prevalent on the internet than stuff that have shelf lives as, as our snacks would. And so uh, snacking is not yet quite as robust as some of these other categories. It is forecasted that between 3 and 10% of snacking revenue will be online over the next couple of years. So we take it very seriously. We've set a, a very aggressive ambition for ourselves to, uh, to realize at least a billion dollars in revenue over that period. Uh, and you know, again, we have so many products that are iconic consumer brands uh, that play a, an important part in consumers' repertoires. So products like Belvita, for example, uh, which is the leading breakfast biscuit, those kinds of products lend themselves very easily to a subscription model. At the same time, we have products like Trident uh, that lend themselves very nicely to customized packaging. So for example, we just did a tie-in with the new Star Wars movie where we created a bottle, a Star Wars bottle of Trident gum that was available only uh, on the internet. So there's an opportunity for subscription models. There's an opportunity for customization. There's an opportunity for larger pack sizes. What we find is obviously lunchbox, packing snacks in, in lunchboxes is a, is, a, is a very common consumer behavior. And our ability to make large boxes of those small snack packs, which you might not find in a traditional grocery store, is, is attractive to our consumers. So e-commerce is clearly a growing consumer behavior. It's important for us as the leading snacking company to play in that space, uh, but it's gonna take a while for that to come along because it's just, there's a shelf life uh, and, and there's actually also so, more, so many more variants uh, of snacks. And so the ability for a partner like Amazon, and we, they are our uh, main partner here in the US, Alibaba is our main partner in China, and we've got nice growing businesses with both of those partners, in addition to working with traditional bricks and mortar retailers like Walmart uh, and Tesco. But the ability to get our inventory right with those partners is really important. So you gotta know what sells, and you gotta make sure that we have it in stock. One thing that I've been thinking a lot, so I'm based in San Francisco and write about technology, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is the rise of intelligent agents. So Facebook, for example, is investing in Messenger where they're, they're hoping to have an AI um, system by which you can complete commercial transactions. But it raises the question for me of whether brands become less or more important. Because if it's algorithms that are making the purchases, if you just say, please deliver me cookies, um, and Facebook's algorithms are able to determine based on what they know about you, what sort of cookie you'd like, does the brand become less or more important going forward? You know, I, I think, it, actually, brands will be always important. They are an imprimatur of safety and quality. You know, markets like China, when they understand that, I mean, that knowing the brand is very, very important. So I do think there will be algorithms, search algorithms that can be helpful. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the shopping list uh, for e-commerce is, is the key driver of purchases, and most of that comes from what's ever in, their, in, in the consumer's mental repertoire. So I'm, I'm sure there, there can be AI-type uh, algorithms over time. Um, the key then, of course, would be just to be to make sure that our brands continue to have the profile 
that is important to consumers. Uh, obviously, areas like health and well-being is of great interest to us because that's where consumers are going. And so as we think about that, we think about what's our ingredient profile, how simple is our list of ingredients, can you pronounce them, can you find them in your kitchen, and that would be the kinds of things, I, I assume those are the kinds of things you'd find in a search algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think brands will, will continue to be a critical imprimatur of quality and familiarity and comfort, uh, again, especially outside the US, but I also think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the profile and the ingredients of our brands uh, are consistent with what consumers would want. How are you dealing with the trend toward um, health and well-being and this focus on ingredients, and, which doesn't always favor packaged foods as a category? Have you seen any evidence that people have shifted away from packaged foods, or is it just towards smaller portion sizes? It's actually not away from packaged foods. It's away from some types of packaged foods. I mean, I think, first of all, you start with the fact that in a consumer diet, there's a variety of snacks that serve different purposes. Without a doubt, uh, fuel is a, an emerging and very rapidly growing need around the world, particularly as consumers are eating more in between meals. And it is imperative that we, as the largest snack provider, make sure that those offerings provide the nutrition and the, and the well-being properties that our consumers are interested in. So as I mentioned, products like Belvita are designed to have some technology that actually satiates you from one meal to the next. And uh, that is something that's very valuable to consumer on an airplane, in the office, and uh, uh, anywhere on the go, frankly, anywhere around the world. So it's, we continue to focus on the profile of our products. We just launched a product here in the US called Good Thins. It just debuted this past week. I was, I was telling Alexandra about it. And it really is the, the whole premise of it is to take the goodness of products like Wheat Thins and Triscuits and bring them to the consumer in other, through other substrate forms. So bases of rice, so it's gluten-free, bases of chickpea, bases of sweet potato. And so as we think about our offerings to the consumer, our focus it continues to be on those ingredients that are a part of uh, his or her healthy lifestyle. And you'll see us do more and more of that. That said, within treats, there's still a, uh, a very robust market for treats, particularly in difficult times. Is treats junk and, food? Uh, well, I think, I think junk food is a, uh, Just so we're all a, is a pejorative term. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I would say that uh, there are many of our products that, uh, that, that don't necessarily have um, the kind of nutritional profile that you would like to keep you going all day long but they are an important part of our consumers' lives. And so a small piece of chocolate, uh, an Oreo cookie in a, uh, uh, on a day when the stock market has plummeted 200 points is really useful. <laughs> <laughs> so our focus there is on, I mean, we, we, we are paying attention, even for our indulgent products, we are paying attention to thinking about smaller sizes, thinner versions. We, we launched a product called Oreo Thins here in the US about a year ago. It's been a smashing success because it is a lighter eat product. It is fewer calories. It came from China actually, again, because that consumer was looking for that even more than, uh, than the American consumer. Um, so we're finding that even our treats, as we think about them, they're about thinner versions, they're about smaller pack sizes. All of our biscuits, for example, all of our cookies are in resealable packages, so you don't eat the whole package in one sitting. Um, the opportunity to provide portion control, to make the, the uh, ingredients, put them on the front panel so consumers can see what's in there. So I think there's no question that consumers around the world are concerned about well-being and making sure that what's coming into their, into their bodies fits that profile. And we're doing what we can and need to, to to be able to help them to make wise choices in that regard. So one more question from me, and then I want to open it up to the audience. When we think about disruption, it strikes me as that it plays out slightly differently in your industry, because there are higher barriers to entry. Brand is important, and food quality people care about. One needs distribution yep. in stores. But who worries you right now um, when you think about the disruptors? Um, for us, we find that there are small local players 
that sometimes either can create um, messages that are not really true about the products uh, and, and cl make claims, for example. So for example, there was a product in China, uh, a biscuit product that was uh, called mo monkey head mushroom biscuit. And monkey head mushrooms in Chinese uh, uh, lore uh, and, and in Chinese medicine has uh, restorative properties. And so there was this perception that this product that was, quote, made from monkey head mushrooms was going to be in some way restorative. Obviously, it had been kissed by a monkey head mushroom, but uh, you know there was no way to, uh, to be able to communicate that message. So what I worry about is that there are some in the food industry, there are some folks out there that are making some claims about their products that are not that are not legitimate, and smaller companies are less suspect and really can fly a little bit under the radar screen. Does that I've, happen in America as well? It does. It does uh, it, until such time as the FDA then takes it off the shelf. But it could be out there for some period of time. Again, it's more of an issue for us in in other markets around the world. There's a huge movement, uh, certainly in Europe, that's coming here about genetically modified organisms. There's been a, a, a real uh, uh, consumer scare about about the those ingredients, and uh, uh, and a, and a, it's created a concern that's not necessarily fact based. But those kinds of things trouble me and 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 worry me. And we spend a lot of time monitoring what's going on in some of these local markets, both the negative but also the potential opportunities. We brought a, bought a company uh, about a year and a half ago called Enjoy Life Foods here in the US. Small company, um, and their whole premise was that they were free from the top eight allergens. Obviously, about 1% of the world today is gluten-free, but about 10% of the population is related in some way to someone who has gluten allergies. And this is a fabulous line of snacks that have no gluten, no eggs, no peanuts, and a, a, a number of the other allergens. Our focus is scaling that up as quickly as we can because it's a consumer opportunity around the world. But as you rightly point out, the challenge of setting up uh, allergen-free factories, setting up a distribution network to distribute these products, that's something that we're uniquely well positioned to do. And, and so it's one of the reasons that, uh, that we bought the product. At the same time, there's a lot of things they do exceptionally well. It's a, it, was, it is a small company. We've chosen to run them as a standalone operation <laughs> because I thought we could learn a lot from how they do things, how they move quickly, that would be helpful on, our, on the rest of our businesses. And last question, what have you learned? Has there been one takeaway? Um, I think they, they, they're, because they're small, they can test and fail a lot faster than, than typically our guys do. And frankly, that's been one of the biggest learnings that uh, my team has had even as we've worked with startups is that you don't have to bet the ranch uh, with, 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 with everything that you're doing. There's ways to just put it in one store see how it does, and, uh, and, then, and learn from that, and then, and then take it on the road. So I think that's been a, a really powerful idea. I think they've learned a lot from us about food safety and some of the, 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 the guardrails, um, because when you scale up production, you've got to be very careful to make sure that your products are safe. Yes. I'd love to open it up for questions. Are there any in the audience? Yes, in the center right here. A microphone is coming to you. Hi, my name is Joe Kelsey, and I'm from Indiana, and I really appreciate your comments today. Uh, when we talk about the speed of an innovation, I just wanted to, wanted to hear your, your, your thoughts. You mentioned things like GMOs and uh, ways that we can really um, move innovation at different points of the supply chain at a rapid pace. Does innovation ever move faster than what uh, other parts of the, of the supply chain or the cu customer chain, and maybe some of your experiences uh, as it relates to that? Question. Very good question. I think you know it comes back a little bit to the first comment about innovation not being in a vacuum. So for example, in the old days, we might have R&D developing something that was not really being done in concert with marketing yet. And so you had this great thing, but you didn't know how to sell it. Similarly, making sure that the packaging is going to fit on the shelf and be shelf ready for customers. So it starts by making sure that all of the different functions that have to take this innovation to market are involved in the design because very often we did find ourselves in a situation, for example, where we'd develop a product and then discover that the ingredient was illegal in Brazil. 
Um, and, that's, and that's great, you know, so, so a great success in the US, but if I want to take an idea to 50 countries after it's been proven, we've got to make sure that those ingredients are legal. So we've, this idea of having cross-functional innovation teams that represent all the key disciplines are really, have been really important. The other piece of it for us is we've looked at our innovation process from front to back to think about how could we shortcut each of the steps. I talked a little bit about how we've shortcut consumer research. There's also the question of how could we shortcut some of the capital, because typically the lead time for us is buying equipment to make whatever we're talking about. And so once again, having that conversation up front so that in some cases, for example, we have found Oreo Fins is a great example where the, the equipment actually is the same equipment that we use to make uh, our regular Oreo. It's a slightly different mold. Knowing that allowed us to order the regular line because we could use it anywhere else even if the product was not successful. But we were ready uh, to be able, to, 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 be able to, uh, to, to put the mold in and, and get going as quickly as possible. So I think it's a combination of cross-functional teams brought in early and really examining each phase of your, uh, of your uh, idea to market program that will allow you to figure out where you could save some time. Um, yes, right over here in the white shirt. Hello, Greg Banks from Innovation Consultancy, Maddox Douglas. Uh, we notice with a lot of our clients, especially larger companies, they first invest in innovation to build out a new muscle, and then they run into a sticking point where they have to transform it into a real discipline with revenue goals. It's apparent that at Mondelez you've gone through that transition quite handily. Can you reflect back on that? Did you see a sticking point like that? Can you reflect back on how you helped the company get through it? Did it have anything to do with your... Uh, your thought earlier about integrating back into the core team. Just yeah. how, did that, how did you get through that sticking point of becoming a real business discipline? You know, our sticking point was a little different, which was that we had a lot of guys inventing things that didn't have great profit margins. And so we've, we've uh, you know, so I think the message is when you have an issue, you've got to then think about what's the problem and therefore how do you solve it. In our case, we've now made the gross margin an important part of the conversation up front, again, by bringing in all the, the relevant folks. So we don't have marketing folks off inventing some idea that is never going to be able to make any money. I, so I do think that's a, that, that's, that's a big piece of it. The other issue for us was the handoff. And it is one of the, one of the things that's bad about having a siloed innovation group. Because often the folks that, that actually birthed the idea then hand it off to someone who, who didn't learn along the way. So what we started to do there was to make sure that we had someone on the, on the inception team that would then follow the idea through to market. And, and again, part of the reason uh, we moved to uh, these global categories, as I described them, um, is because we had folks relearning stuff over and over again. So for example, we invented Belvita in France um, we, when we brought it to the U.S., I didn't want the U.S. guys to have to relearn everything we knew about Belvita. By making that the ownership of a global biscuit category person who owns Belvita, understands all the usage and the brand equity, understands how it differs market by market, we can really cut down on the discontinuity that happens when you have a lot of handoffs. So that's, that's how we've dealt with it. All right, I think, unfortunately, I have to wrap it up. Irene, thank you so much for joining us. It was My a pleasure. pleasure. My and pleasure. Um, I'd love to welcome Matthew to the stage. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.